Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. And if you're a fan of Canadian History X, make sure you check out my other shows, From John to Justin and Canada, A Yearly Journey. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. It helps keep this show going. All right, on with the show. Have you ever wondered how Ottawa became Canada's capital rather than Montreal, which was the largest and most populous city at the time? In 1857, Queen Victoria chose the small lumber town as the new capital of the province of Canada over Montreal, which had the history, direct access to the St. Lawrence River and one of the busiest harbours on the continent, surrounded by grand buildings and a modern infrastructure perfectly suited to be the capital. Ottawa was more of a frontier town with small buildings and population, so why not Montreal? The thing is, Montreal had once been the capital. I'm Craig Baird. This is Canadian History X, and today I'm sharing the story of how Montreal ruined its chances of ever being the capital after there was an attack on the Governor General, a shootout with the Premier, and a burning of the Parliament buildings. In the 1840s, Canada was taking its first baby steps towards Confederation, We often think of our road to nationhood as smooth, with signing of papers and a handshake. That's what happened in 1867, the year we became a nation, but it's not the whole story of how we got there. For three decades prior to Confederation, there were rebellions and violence as Canadians struggled to separate themselves from the faraway power of the United Kingdom. After the War of 1812, Canadians began to feel a sense of pride in their successful resistance to an American invasion, and there was a growing call for political reform spreading from Lower Canada to Upper Canada. The citizens wanted to govern themselves. Lower Canada, which is now Quebec, had the strongest call for reform because for decades, the majority population made up of Francophones came to resent the power the Anglophones, a minority, had over them. At first they tried to bring change through political means, as the concept of responsible government emerged. Responsible government is one that is accountable to the people, not the monarch, based on the Westminster system of a parliamentary democracy. In Canada, it depends on the support of an elected assembly, so Francophones drafted petitions, resolutions, and protested for responsible government. But it went nowhere. After years of not seeing change, some Francophones decided that the only way to bring about change was through rebellion. And that is exactly what they did. On November 6, 1837, the Lower Canada Rebellion began as 30,000 rebels fought for Lower Canada against 11,000 British regulars and 33,000 Canadian militia. Lasting just over one year, it ended on November 10, 1838 at the Battle of Beauharnois with the final defeat of Lower Canada rebels. By the time it was over, over 200 people had died and 1,600 were wounded on both sides. Upper Canada, inspired by the Lower Canada rebels, also took up arms in December 1837 in the Upper Canada Rebellion, which was defeated in less than a month. The leader was William Lyon Mackenzie, the first mayor of Toronto and a grandfather of our longest serving Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King. I will be covering the Lower and Upper Canada rebellions in much more detail later this year. For now, what you need to know is that following these events, the British government dispatched Lord Durham to investigate. His report in 1839 recommended that Lower and Upper Canada be united into one as the province of Canada and ruled by responsible government. On February 10, 1841, the two Canadas became one, but it was divided into Canada East and Canada West, but a responsible government was not implemented. The Governor-General answered only to the British government, not the province of Canada Parliament or its people. The first capital was in Kingston, albeit temporarily, and a vote to make it permanent was rejected in 1842, and a new city had to be found. Montreal was recommended as a suitable choice since it was the largest city, and in 1844, it became the capital. To prepare, 
architect John Ostel renovated St. Anne's Market in Montreal to serve as the Parliament building. Built in 1832, St. Anne's Market was a 100-meter-long Georgian-style building that housed the first indoor market in Montreal. Underneath were the first enclosed sewers in Canada. As part of the decision to make Montreal the capital, 23,000 books from the Parliamentary Library, Legislative Assembly and Legislative Council were moved from Kingston to Montreal. But in the background, a political crisis was brewing. The British Parliament had recently passed the Canadian Corn Act, which favoured Canadian wheat and corn in English markets by reducing duties. This upset farmers elsewhere in the British Empire, and they pressured the government to repeal the act. That happened in 1846, and immediately caused a recession in Canada as the corn and wheat market dried up. The Canadian government pressured the colonial secretary Earl Grey to have the United Kingdom negotiate lower duties on Canadian products going into the United States. This was a growing market, and lower duties would allow for more profit for farmers and merchants. When the United Kingdom refused this, the political crisis deepened as property values fell and bankruptcies grew. With the growing tension, the province of Canada set up a commission to determine if residents of what was previously Lower Canada were owed any damages from the rebellion. Released in April 1846, the report stated that only those who did not participate in the rebellion were owed. The report gave a figure of £241,965, but stated it did not expect more than £100,000 to be awarded after claims were investigated further. On June 9, 1846, the Assembly of the Province of Canada authorized only £9,986 to be awarded, but before anything else could be done, the province headed into an election. The ruling Tories were out, and the reformers were in. Robert Baldwin and Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine became co-premiers of the province of Canada. Baldwin managed Canada West, La Fontaine managed Canada East, and they agreed to work together to bring responsible government to Canadians. In February 1849, La Fontaine introduced the Rebellion Losses Bill to further compensate residents of former Lower Canada who were caught in the crossfire and suffered property damage during the conflict. La Fontaine saw it as a way to heal wounds left by the Rebellion and show French Canadians they were treated equally by the government. The Tories, who were in opposition, did not see it that way. They saw it as a sign of French domination, and they did not want to pay those they saw as being disloyal to the Crown. Tories Henry Sherwood and Alan McNabb charged that the bill was an insult to loyal subjects. The heated debate on the bill began on February 13, 1849, and more than once it turned from verbal attacks to physical attacks between members of the Assembly. William Blake, the Solicitor General, said the Tories were the true rebels. When asked to apologize, he refused and a fight broke out in the spectator gallery. Blake and McNabb then came to blows and had to be separated. In the media, Anglophone newspapers opposed the bill and any payment to those in Lower Canada, while Francophone newspapers supported the bill and the compensation it would provide. On February 17, 1849, Tory politicians held a public meeting where a petition was prepared, asking Governor-General Lord Elgin to dissolve Parliament and call new elections. Attendees also burned La Fontaine in effigy. Lord Elgin became Governor-General in 1847 and seemed to support responsible government which was a marked departure from the previous Governors General who refused to consider it. But then he distanced himself from the province of Canada's political affairs and focused on immigration instead. Because he refused to meddle in parliamentary affairs, the Tory petition had no effect and Parliament was not dissolved. Elgin said, The Tory party are doing what they can by menace, intimidation, and appeals to drive me to a coup d'etat. On March 9, 1849, the bill passed the Legislative Assembly. Canada West members voted 47 in favour and 18 against. Canada East members were overwhelmingly in favour, 30 in favour and 4 against. Six days later, on March 15, the Legislative Council passed the bill 20 to 14. On March 22, the crowd carried effigies of Baldwin, William Blake and rebel leader William Lyne Mackenzie and set them on fire. This was a powder keg environment, and now it fell to Lord Elgin to give it royal assent and, with that simple stroke of a pen, everything changed. On April 25, 1849, just over a month after the government passed the bill, Lord Elgin made his way to the Parliament building to give his assent to a new tariff bill. At 5pm he signed the bill and, since he was at Parliament, 
he decided he might as well sign another 41 bills waiting for royal assent, including the Rebellion Losses Bill. As he signed, the spectator gallery became agitated, but signing passed with little fanfare within the building, while outside the building, word spread, and a crowd formed. At 6 p.m., Lord Elgin left the building and was met by a crowd that threw eggs and rocks at him when they saw him. He rushed to his carriage and ordered his driver to get him home as quickly as possible. And as his carriage bounded down the road, the crowd pursued him. Meanwhile, the Montreal Gazette, a newspaper that opposed the Rebellion Losses Bill, decried it and called for those in opposition to assemble at the Place de Homs. The newspaper wrote, Anglo-Saxons, you must live for the future. Your blood and race will now be supreme if true to yourselves. You will be English at the expense of not being British. To whom and what is your allegiance now? Over 1,500 people showed up at the square in Old Montreal to protest. They heard speakers criticize Lord Elgin for signing the bill and called for Queen Victoria to remove him from his position. Among the crowd was Alfred Perry, a local man who told the crowd, The time for petitions is over, but if men who are present here are serious, let them follow me to the Parliament building. After instigating the crowd, Perry and his followers made the 10-minute walk to the Parliament building. Along the way, they smashed the windows of the Montreal Pilot, the only English-language newspaper in Montreal that supported the bill. Once they reached the Parliament building, Perry and his followers joined the small crowd that had thrown rocks and eggs at Lord Elgin, and together they broke windows and then entered the building and vandalized it. A man, only identified as O'Connor, tried to stop the crowd and got hit in the head with an axe handle for doing so. Nearby, there was an unattended fire truck and riders took its 11-meter ladder to use as a battering ram on the building doors. And once the doors broke, rioters flooded into the building. They smashed desks and chairs and took a portrait of Papineau off the wall and stomped on it. In an image very reminiscent of the January 6, 2021 United States Capitol building attack, where a mob of supporters of then US President Donald Trump, one rioter sat in the speaker's chair and declared that Parliament was now dissolved. The Montreal Gazette wrote, The mob proceeded to demolish everything in the hall. One fellow took possession of the speaker's chair and declared in a solemn voice that he dissolved Parliament in the Queen's name. Then, the smell of smoke filled the air. Alfred Perry was responsible and years later he said he threw a brick at a clock, but it hit a lit gas lamp by accident which caused the fire to spread. Newspapers reported that rioters after smashing windows also threw torches into the building. A reporter with the Montreal Gazette said he saw men light papers in a storeroom and then threw them around the room. Now, regardless of how the fire started, it quickly grew as broken gas lamps and lines fueled it as it spread through the building. Soon, it was an uncontrollable inferno, the Montreal Gazette reported. The wind was high, and in a very few moments, the wooden gallery and the canvas covering were enveloped by flames. When the fire department arrived, rioters prevented them from entering the building, but when the blaze spread to a nearby house in the Grey Nuns Hospital, rioters did not interfere. In the parliamentary library, 23,000 books went up in flames and only 200 were saved, along with a portrait of Queen Victoria, which was taken off the wall by four men and rescued from the blaze. Montreal Gazette reported, A beautiful full-length portrait of our most gracious sovereign, the Queen, had been saved and this simple act told eloquently of the loyal feeling of the crowd. One of those men was Sanford Fleming, a Scottish-Canadian engineer and inventor. Later in his life, he created our first postage stamp and promoted the worldwide use of standard time zones, a prime meridian, and a 24-hour clock as key elements to communicating the accurate time. Meanwhile, the Parliament building burned to the ground, and losses were estimated to be about $400,000. The Montreal Gazette wrote, The 25th of April will be looked upon henceforth as a black day for Canada. The house lies in smoking ruins, the stone of which it was built being blue limestone, the walls are whitened, crumbled, and tottering in a very dangerous state. On April 26, the rests were made. Among those incarcerated were James Frears, the publisher of the Montreal Gazette, William Mack, the secretary of the British American League, Hugh Montgomery, Augustus Heward, and Alfred Perry. Soon after, Attorney General Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine ordered that the men be released to lower the tension still brewing in the city. The evening after the blaze, rioters returned to the streets and vandalized the homes of politicians who supported the rebellion losses bill, including LaFontaine's home and stable which was set on fire. The fire spread and destroyed much of LaFontaine's library before it was brought under control. 
LaFontaine's counterpart, Robert Baldwin, was also a target. Rioters vandalized one of his boarding houses even though he didn't participate in the debate over the bill. Tory opposition saw that things were also getting out of control, and on April 28th, a group of Tories convened a Friends of Peace meeting where they attempted to soothe followers by petitioning Queen Victoria to remove Lord Elgin from office. That same day at 6 p.m., over 800 men, mostly francophones, showed up at the armory to receive weapons as the government called for a special police force to keep the peace. A group of rioters arrived soon after and threw rocks at them. The newly armed police force fought back and injured three rioters. General Charles Gore, who had fought at the Battle of St. Denis during the Lower Canada Rebellion, stepped in to calm rioters by swearing that the new constables would be disarmed by the next morning. He kept his word, and less than 24 hours after it was formed, the new police force was demobilized. Over the next two days, people looked for someone to blame for the fire and subsequent riots, and Lord Elgin became the scapegoat for the Thistle Society and St. Andrew's Society, who both struck his name from their list of benefactors. The Montreal Gazette reported, They have no sympathy with his actions and regret that he should hail from Scotland. On April 30th, Lord Elgin left his home to attend a meeting at the Legislative Assembly at its new and temporary location. As he journeyed through the city, people threw rocks and eggs at his carriage. Upon arrival at the Legislative Assembly, Elgin and the other representatives had to enter the building under an armed escort. After the meeting, Lord Elgin made his way home as protesters again threw rocks at his carriage and a man sitting with the driver was struck in the head and seriously injured. Waiting for the violence to stop, Lord Elgin spoke to Colonial Secretary Earl Grey and asked that he be removed from his post. But Earl Grey refused because he felt that agreeing to the rioter demands would only encourage future unrest. For the next month, Parliament dealt with the aftermath of the Parliament fire and the first order of business was to get the government out of Montreal. On May 19th, Henry Sherwood, a Tory politician, put forward a motion to have the capital alternate between Toronto and Quebec City, which was approved by a vote of 34 to 29. Montreal's time as the province of Canada's capital had come to an end. But that, not quite the end of the troubles for the city. In August, several arson suspects were rounded up by police, which sparked new riots in Montreal. On August 18th, the mob attacked the home of Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine, but this time he was alerted beforehand and had friends on hand to defend his home. In the small skirmish that ensued, a young blacksmith named William Mason was killed. When an inquest was held days later into Mason's death, rioters set fire to the building, but the fire department was able to respond quickly and save it. There were now calls for Lord Elgin to call on the army to restore order, but Elgin refused as he believed it would only inflame more riots. And this choice was a relatively new concept for the time, but it worked. Over the next few weeks, the fury of the mob slowly died down and things went back to normal in the former capital. Meanwhile, Parliament was prorogued until it was called back into session on May 14, 1850 in Toronto, where English was the common language of all main ethnic and religious groups. Toronto was the capital from 1849 to 1851, then it moved to Quebec City until 1855, then back to Toronto until 1859, when it moved to Quebec City until 1865. During this time, Queen Victoria chose Ottawa as the new and current capital in 1857. The small lumber town was chosen for two main reasons. The first was that it was isolated and far from the American border, as living veterans of the War of 1812 still remembered and were concerned about an American invasion. The second reason was logistical. Ottawa was halfway between Toronto and Kingston, and Montreal and Quebec City. The first stage of construction on the Parliament buildings in Ottawa was completed in 1865, just as the final session of the last Parliament of the Province of Canada was held before Canadian Confederation in 1867. Construction of the present library began a few years earlier in 1859. George Bartholomew Farabois was hired to rebuild the collection and, and spent two years and £4,400 to purchase new volumes in London and Paris. The collection arrived in Ottawa in 1866 and the library was completed in 1876 when the 47,000 volumes, including several donated by Queen Victoria, were installed. The site of the Parliament building in Montreal became a market again, but that was destroyed by another fire in 1901. 
Eventually, it was turned into a parking lot, but since 2010, the lot has been the site of an archaeological excavation which has been unearthing artifacts lost during the 1849 fire. Robert Baldwin and Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine continued to serve as co-premiers of the province of Canada until 1851. Baldwin died in 1858, and Lafontaine died in 1864. Neither man lived long enough to see Canadian Confederation. As for Alfred Perry, the man who supposedly started the fire, he went on to become, very ironically, the fire commissioner for Montreal. He passed away in 1900 at the age of 80. Now, while the Parliament building fire robbed us of many books and papers now lost to history, it also may have preserved just a few. In 2011, archaeological excavations dug 1.5 meters under the site where the Parliament building once stood, where archaeologists came across dozens of burned books carbonized and preserved by the fire itself. This allowed historians and archaeologists to get a glimpse into the books from 200 years ago. They also found two sealing stamps, one from the Council Library and one from the Legislative Assembly, along with many items used by the government of the province of Canada. And this is why the site has been called Canada's Pompeii. I hope you enjoyed that episode and our look at the Montreal Parliament Fire. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of Dila Velasquez. Audio production and design by Rosalind Kufour. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.